Hallelujah. Well, praise God. God is good and his mercy endures forever. At this time, we're going to go right into the word of God that he has for us this morning. Hallelujah. If you would turn with me to Esther, the book of Esther. If you would, if you would turn with me to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. And we're going to start at Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5. Hallelujah. Let's start at Esther chapter 5. And this morning, we're going to continue with our series, which we've been on, Chosen, the story of Esther. Chosen, the story of Esther. Chosen, the story of Esther. As we've looked at this particular message series, we've, we've looked at the beginning of this particular story of Esther in Esther chapter 1, where we saw that King Ahasuerus, he was a great king, a mighty king. He was a great king, a mighty king. He had an opulent kingdom, a kingdom of opulence and wealth and a vast kingdom. And Ahasuerus, he, he had a queen, and her name was Vashti. And Vashti, she, she was very beautiful, and she, she was the queen, and she was in a position of power. And she had obtained favor with King Ahasuerus in order to obtain the position of queen. And the king, he, he threw a great feast. He threw a great feast in which he showed the, the grace and the power and the majesty of his kingdom and it had great significance. This feast had great significance. He, he invited all of the princes and rulers of the, the various provinces of his kingdom, the very power of Persia and Media, the, the, the very structure and infrastructure of his kingdom, all of the princes and rulers, they were gathered at this grand, beautiful, opulent feast he had vessels of gold, each vessel made diverse from one another, and he invited both the, the high and the low, the great and the small, to the feast. And for 180 days, he, he showed the greatness of his kingdom and the expanse of his power, and it had great administrative significance, and, and it had a great significance in, in showing the strength of his kingdom. And so Vashti, being the queen, she had the crown royal. She had the crown royal, and she was also a representative of the strength and the majesty and the glory of the kingdom in her beauty, in her, her majesty, in her dignity. All of that was to represent the and help to further show the strength and the majesty of the kingdom of King Ahasuerus. And so during this particular feast, after the king had, he had, he had, shown, he had become happy and had become um, uh, jubilant, then he was going to present to him his crown jewel, his beautiful wife, Vashti and queen with the crown royal. It was not just because she was beautiful, but she, she, wore the crown royal, which was representative of the beauty and the majesty and the power of the kingdom. Now the scripture has told us that the wife is the glory of her husband. And so a wife is the glory of her husband. We being the bride of Christ as the saints of God in the church, we are the glory of Christ. We're the glory of Christ. So the wife being the, the, the crown jewel of her husband. And so Vashti being the queen wearing the crown royal, she represented the glory of his opulent and vast kingdom. 
And when she was called to come in before the king, Vashti, she was, she was having a feast as well for the women of the kingdom and which she was sharing in the power and it was, it was fine for her to have her feast. However, when it was time for her to fulfill her ultimate purpose of representing the kingdom, Vashti, when she was called upon, she refused to come. And she refused to come and serve the kingdom. And this caused great uh, embarrassment to King Ahasuerus, who was a great king, and he had the power of his kingdom, all the princes and rulers of his kingdom. It caused great embarrassment to him, the king, and he in great anger for him. And he being a king that was one that followed protocol. Not He didn't follow just his emotions. Sure, he was angry. Sure, sure, he was embarrassed. But he wanted to know, because this was such an important feast, he wanted to know from his wise men and his administration, how should he handle this from a, uh, a legal, or uh, according to the law standpoint, because of the great significance that it had upon, and the symbolic um, significance that it had upon his kingdom, because of all the people that were there that witnessed this refusal of Queen Vashti when it came to serving her purpose. And so his wise men, they advised him that due to the fact that Vashti was the queen and she, her, how she behaved herself would be seen by all the other women in the vast kingdom of King Ahasuerus, all the other homes, her behavior was an example. And so we as saints of God, we must realize that we being the bride of Christ and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are examples. We are examples in our behavior of how to behave in the world before our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world, a city set in a position, a city set upon a hill which cannot be hid. And so we show forth the praises or the virtues of the Lord Jesus Christ and the virtues and the ways and nature of God as an example to those that do not know God. And so Vashti, she was in a position as being the queen, as having the crown royal, as being in a position. She was to be a model of dignity, a model of grace, a model of graciousness, a model of honoring her king, the king, King Ahasuerus. However, she refused to carry out her purpose for which she had received the favor and the position. And so the king was advised by his counselors to remove Vashti from her position. And so this gave rise to the search for a new queen. This gave rise to the search for a new queen. And they searched the kingdom, and they, they searched the kingdom for many beautiful young virgins for one to choose one to take the position of Vashti and to become queen. And now this leads us into our, our main, um, the main subject of this particular message, chosen the story of Esther, because Esther, she was one of those young virgins that was chosen as a potential candidate to be selected to be made queen. Esther, she was the daughter of Mordecai. He was her uncle. He had actually adopted Esther. Mordecai had adopted Esther after her parents had died. Her parents had died at a young age for Esther, and Mordecai, her uncle, he adopted her, and he raised her. He taught her the, the principles of God, the ways of God, and he, he guided her in the manners of how to live according to a godly manner, and he trained her. And so when she was selected, she had the training and the ways of God inside of her. She had been, she had been taught the ways of God. And so, and so when she was brought before King Ahasuerus as a candidate to be selected, number one, Esther, she obtained favor. Number one, 
Esther obtained favor amongst all the women that were brought before King Ahasuerus as potential candidates to be uh, selected and considered to become queen. Esther, she obtained favor. She obtained favor with the king. So one of the first uh, prerequisites for being chosen is you obtain favor. So Esther obtained favor. And then after she had obtained favor with the king, the king, he chose her to become queen. And she, she, she was chosen to become queen, and she gained the position, the position of queen. Number two, she obtained the position. And the position was, number three, to serve as King Ahasuerus's queen and to reign with King Ahasuerus as queen that was her purpose to fulfill a purpose as his queen as the glory as the glory of his kingdom to wear the crown royal and to serve in that position that was her purpose so number 4 her purpose was to serve the kingdom the natural kingdom of king ahasuerus and number 5 during her reigning as queen in the kingdom carrying out her purpose in her position for which she had obtained favor there came a problem. The problem was another person was selected by the king in his kingdom. His name was Haman, and he was exalted in King Ahasuerus's kingdom to be made uh, an advanced man and to be advanced above all the princes of the King Ahasuerus and placed in a position as the number two man in the kingdom. And Haman he was in a position and he was serving the kingdom of King Ahasuerus. However, Haman, he had a heart that was adversarial to the true purpose, the true purpose of Esther. Because Esther, not only was Esther put in a position to serve the kingdom of King Ahasuerus, but Esther was put in a position to serve the kingdom of God because Esther, she was a child of God. She was chosen, but she was chosen by God. She was one of God's chosen people. She was chosen by God. And so she represented not only King Ahasuerus' kingdom, but she represented the kingdom of God. And so when Haman who was also set up in the kingdom of Ahasuerus, the natural kingdom, he was conflicted toward the kingdom of God. And so the problem arose when Mordecai, Esther's uncle, he refused to honor the honor that was placed upon Haman. There was something inside of Mordecai, Esther's uncle, that refused to bow down to the spirit that was upon the spirit that was upon Haman. Uh, he saw that there was something devilish, something diabolical in Haman that he refused to bow down to. And when he refused to bow down, Haman, he didn't just get mad at Mordecai, because if it was just about a matter of him dealing with insubordination from one man, he would have dealt with the man. He would have, Haman being in a position, he would have dealt with the man Mordecai. But because there was a different spirit, there was an anti Christ, an anti God spirit on Haman, um, a spirit of destruction, he chose not only to destroy Mordecai, but he found out Mordecai was a Jew. He was one of the people of God, God's kingdom, a God that was that was opposite to what Haman reverenced Saul, what he served, uh, his kingdom. And he chose to not only come against Mordecai as a man, but to destroy all the people of Mordecai. Because Haman, he was trying to wipe out the people that worship the God that Mordecai worshiped. And so we're looking here at Esther chapter 5, we're looking here at Esther chapter 5. So once that the problem came to light that Haman was seeking to destroy all the people of Mordecai, of which Esther, she was one of those people, 
Mordecai, he came before the king, he came before the palace and the gate of the king in sackcloth and ashes uh, mourning, and he called out, not only was he calling out to the king, but he was calling out to Esther who was placed in a position inside the palace. So she was placed in a position, Esther was placed in a position inside the palace that she could carry out a, a purpose of solving the problem. And so Mordecai, he being in a position representing God in, in her life, teaching her the principles of God, he made a call for her to fulfill her purpose. And so Esther, she answered the call. Looking at verse, Esther chapter 4 quickly, starting at verse 14, and this is Mordecai, his, his words to Esther in the call. He says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And so Mordecai was saying that you have been placed in the kingdom. You've been placed in the palace. You have obtained, number one, favor. You have obtained, number two, this position. Number three, for a purpose, and this is the purpose. Number four, you've been placed in the kingdom, not only to serve King Ahasuerus' kingdom, but to serve the kingdom of God. You're representing the kingdom of God. Number five, you have been placed in a position for such a time as this to deal with this problem of Haman seeking to destroy the children of God. And so number six, Mordecai was calling. He was placing the call to Esther to fulfill her purpose for which she was placed in the position. And so he says to her, you have, you have been, verse 14, the last portion, he says, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And so he was bringing to light the purpose and he made forth the call. And so Esther, in verse 15, then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. So she answers the call. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. In other words, she answered the call and she prepared herself. She prepared herself in prayer and fasting. She was willing to go into three days of prayer and fasting. And so today, as we look at Chosen, the story of Esther, we're continuing in looking at number seven. We looked at number one, favor, number two, the position, number three, the purpose, number four is to serve the kingdom, number five, we looked at the problem, and number six, we saw that the call has come for her to answer the, the problem and address the problem because she's been put in a position to do so, and number seven, we're looking at the courage and the strategy, the courage and the strategy. We're going to look at the courage to answer the call. The courage to answer the call and the strategy that God gave to Esther in order to solve the problem of Haman seeking to destroy the kingdom of God and the children of God. And so we see, first of all, in verse 16, Esther said that she was going to go into three days of fasting, eating nothing for three days, night or day, not only her, but also her maidens and all the kingdom of God. And so that was preparation for a courageous move. So she prepared for a courageous move. She prepared to go into a courageous move. Preparation for the courageous move. She didn't just do it out of her flesh. She didn't fight fire with fire or she didn't go with it carnally. Because the scripture lets us know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There was a stronghold in the kingdom 
of Ahasuerus where the children of Israel, they dwelled. They were not at the top in the kingdom. So this is this strategy, this strategy, even Haman being an enemy in the kingdom, he was placed in a position for a purpose, just like Esther was placed in a position for a purpose, because he was placed in a position, his purpose was to give way, uh, give an opportunity for God to pull down a stronghold in the kingdom of Ahasuerus, where the children of Israel, they were the tail in the kingdom. They were on the bottom in the kingdom. Haman was placed in a position so that Esther, who was also placed in a position, and if she fulfilled her call, then enlargement and deliverance could come to the Jews in that kingdom where they could switch and they could be placed on top and no longer on the bottom. So the enemy was being used. God was using that enemy, Haman. God was using that problem. God will use your problem to cause you to confront the problem, overcome the problem, and put you on top. And he'll use your problem for you to confront the problem, overcome the problem, and put you on top. Well, what's the testimony of that? David. David, he was going out to take some lunch to his brothers. David was going out to take some lunch to his brothers. They were on the battlefield. And Goliath, he was taunting the army of Israel and saying, send me out a man to fight me. And if you win against me, we'll be your servants. And if we win against you, you'll be our servants. But the children of Israel, they were, they were being oppressed by the Philistines. But David, he came out not to fight, but to bring some lunch. But because David had the courage, we're talking about number seven, the courage and the strategy, but I'm showing you how courage and strategy works together, not only with Esther, but also we're looking quickly at how it worked with David. Because the army of Israel, Saul and his army, they were afraid of Goliath. They were afraid of Goliath. They were hidden in the caves on the other side, and they were afraid of Goliath. But David, when he heard the taunting of Goliath, David, he got courage as a young man. David, he was chosen and he got courage as a young man and he was willing to take on, take on Goliath and he took him on with what he had. He took his five smooth stones and his slingshot and David, he ran toward the giant and he slung his stone and it sunk into the head of Goliath and Goliath, the giant or the problem fell to the ground and David took the giant's sword and cut his head off and brought his head to Saul and he said, this is how you get ahead in life. And he took the head of the giant to Saul because he solved the problem, but not only did that problem solving, uh, confronting that problem, not only did confronting that problem, but even David had prepared. When he was on the hills with the sheep and singing old psalms and writing songs to God and playing his harp and worshiping. And also David said, I killed the lion and I killed the bear that came to try to take one of my father's sheep. That was preparation. So there's preparation for the courageous move. We're looking at number seven in Chosen, the story of Esther, the courage and the strategy. And we looked at David as an example of how God also used courage and he used a strategy because when David killed Goliath, it didn't just make David put him in a position to become king, but it also put the children of Israel as the head over the Philistines because they chased their enemies after that. 
they chased the Philistine. They were running from the Philistines at first, but then it put the Philistines running from them. Now, going back to Esther and re referring back to Esther chapter 4, verse 16, Esther chapter 4, verse 16, where Esther said, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So there was preparation, the fasting and the prayer, the three days of prayer and fasting was preparation for the courageous move. So we're looking at number seven, the courage and the strategy. We're looking at the courage and the strategy in the message chosen, the story of Esther. We're looking at number seven, the courage and the strategy. And so that was preparation for the courageous move. Now, uh, let's look at Esther chapter five, and we're going to look at this courageous move at the three days of prayer and fasting, not only for Esther, but all of her maidens and all the children of Israel, they went into three days of dedicated prayer and fasting. Why? Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So that again, there was a stronghold of the children of Israel being on the bottom and not being on top. The pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, imagining that they were inferior to those in the kingdom who they felt that they were superior to them. That was an imagination. The children of Israel was not inferior. They were worshipers of God. They were the head and not the tail. They were above only and not beneath. They were the lender and not the borrower according to God's word. But there were imagination, the imagination that they were inferior, pulling down the strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing, every high thing, Haman and the spirit that was upon Haman, the evil spirit of the spirit of Satan, the adversarial spirit that was operating against the children of Israel to destroy them, it was a pulling down that high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And so, this preparation for the courageous move helped to prepare Esther to be able to go in and take this courage and this strategy to address this problem. So Esther chapter five, we're gonna look at verse one. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel. Okay, she put on her royal apparel. She, she put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. So number one, the first part of this courage was, and this strategy, the courage and strategy, she dressed she dressed for the occasion. Esther dressed for the occasion. She dressed to obtain favor. She put on her royal apparel. She put on her royal apparel. You and I, as we confront the problems in our lives, as we confront the problems in our lives, whether it's on your job, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your neighborhood, in your community, whether it's in school, whatever area it may be, you must dress for the occasion. Because again, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we must dress for the occasion. When we go out of the house, we, before we leave the house in the morning, we must take time to put on the whole armor of God. We must take time to be washed in our minds and our hearts with the washing of the water by the word. We must take time to let our, our hearts be renewed and our minds be renewed. 
We must take time to present our bodies and see ourselves as a presentation, as royalty. We must prepare ourselves as we're going out. We must renew, be renewed in the spirit of our minds, knowing that we are sons and daughters of God, knowing that we are members of a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We must fully recognize that. Otherwise, we'll go out trying to act just like the world or trying to take on life just like the world. When you are not of the world, you have been, you have been born again from the world. You have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so you must, you must operate as a child of light. You must operate as the light of the world. For ye are the light of the world, a city set upon a hill. In other words, you have been placed in a position. You have obtained, number one, favor. You have obtained, number two, a position. You have obtained, number three, a purpose. Number four, to serve God's kingdom so that when the problem of the devil and his kingdom and those that rise up against you, the world, the flesh, and the devil, when it comes against you, when that problem come against you of the world, the flesh, and the devil, you can, number four, fulfill your call because you are called to be a son of God. You're called to be a representative of God. You're called to be the salt of the earth, and you should not lose your savor or lose your flavor, but you should be an influencer in the earth. You should show forth the praises or the virtues of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light for you are the light of the world a city set or a city position on a hill that you should show forth or present or show forth the praises you are the light of the world a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid let or allow allow your light to so shine or so very much shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your your father which is in heaven because that is your position and that is your purpose is to serve God's kingdom and no matter what the problem you have a calling and God wants to know that there is a strategy number seven it takes courage and there is a strategy and so first a part of this courage and strategy with Esther she put on her royal apparel so she 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 dressed for the occasion she dressed to obtain favor. And as believers, we must dress with the whole armor of God, God's virtues, and God's virtues as we stand before a natural world. There is an enemy at the table. And, and so we're going we're gonna to look at that. And so it says at verse 2, verse 2 of Esther 5, again, she put on her royal apparel, and there, verse 2 of Esther 5, and it was so... When the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. So Esther, she used everything that she has. God wants you to use everything that you have. Your good looks, that is, that is a part of favor. God is giving you that, use it. God wants you to, he wants you to walk with dignity he wants you to present yourself. Again, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, in your living, in your daily living, don't live unto yourself. Don't live unto your own appetites. Don't live unto your own ways because you've received the mercies of God. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. God saved you. He brought you out of darkness. He delivered you from hell. He delivered you from sin. He delivered you from fornication and adultery and, and addiction. He delivered you from all the things that, that sin had you bound by. He delivered you from habits. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Now present your bodies a living 
living sacrifice. Why is it a living sacrifice and not a dead sacrifice? He said, I don't, I'm not calling you to die. He said, I died in your place, but I'm calling you to live. I'm calling you to live for me. Sacrifice your appetite. Let them die. Sacrifice the lust of the flesh. Sacrifice your anger and your fear and your, your unbelief and your malice and your strife. Sacrifice the works of the flesh and live for me and fulfill my virtues, fulfill my love, fulfill my joy, fulfill my peace, my long suffering, my gentleness, my goodness, my meekness, my faithfulness, and my temperance or self-control against such there is no law. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God said, it's only reasonable for you to live like this for me. It's only reasonable for you to live like a holy man, like a holy woman, like an upright person, like a godly person. It's only reasonable for you to live like someone that will forgive others because you have been forgiven, that will walk in love toward others because of the love that you have received. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. In other words, you've received the mercies of God. He said, because of the mercies that you've received. He said, you should live as a living sacrifice. You should live in a way that you present yourself. And so in order to present yourself, that requires a preparation for the courageous move before you leave the house in the morning. This is a part of the courage and the strategy. Number seven, the courage and the strategy to overcoming the problem in the world of the world, the flesh and the devil that is an adversary to us, the saints of God. And so, Esther chapter 5, verse 2, it says, And it was so, when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. See, when you, when you show forth the virtues of God, the ways of God, the nature of God, people that come in contact with you, they can't help but show favor towards you. You know? It's, it's practical. It's good sense. If you go to a store and there's a checkout and you stand in line and you're watching, you're in line and one cashier is um, mean to the previous three or four customers and, you know, short and talking smart and you have an opportunity to go over to another line where the person is, they're moving swiftly and they're pleasant, you have a nice day and thank you for shopping here. We really appreciate it, we'll see you next time. Well, who's gonna get the most favor with you? I'm gonna move over. I'm gonna get in the other lane because I don't need somebody cutting my head off with sharp words. I'm gonna get into the lane of the nice person and then I'll remember that nice person because they obtain favor. What are those? Those are virtues. Those are the virtues of God. Walking in love, walking in joy, walking in peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, temperance or self-control. Against such, there is no law. In other words, against those virtues, God's nature, there is no law or limitation. You can't be too loving. You can't be too forgiving. You can't be too compassionate. You can't be too caring and too faithful. You can't be too diligent on your job. You can't be too excellent. Against such, there is no limit. There is no law. And there's nothing that can resist the nature of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is how we overcome, even by our faith or even by our faithfulness to God's principles. So it says in verse 2 of Esther 5, And it was so, when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. She obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. In other words, there's a scripture in Proverbs, and you could just make a, a reference of this, write it down. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Because it says right here, again, 
she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Proverbs 22:29 says, "Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men or average men. Seest thou a man diligent? In other words, carrying out excellent excellence in your business. That word business means your responsibility in life, your deputyship, that which you have been deputized to do by God. You have delegated power. You have been delegated and put in a position. You have delegated power by God because you've been put in a position. Number one, you've obtained favor. Number two, you've been put in a position. Number three, you have been given a purpose. Number four, it is to serve God's kingdom. Number five, so that as the problem of sin, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and all of the works of the devil in the world arises and is prevailing in the earth, you, number six, have a call to carry out to address that problem. And number seven, God, he gives you courage. It takes courage and a strategy to overcome that problem. And the strategy is by carrying out God's principles in his word. We refer to the scripture that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. That sounds weapons and mighty. That sounds like strategy. If you are army and you're, you have weapons, you have might, it's like you're prepared for conflict and you're prepared to win. Hallelujah. And so that scripture in Proverbs twenty two twenty nine 29 says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings, he shall not stand before average men or mean men. It talks about the manner in which you carry out your deputyship or the manner in which you carry out your delegated position for which you receive delegated power or authority or your ministry in life or your responsibility in life. See, is thou a man diligent in his business? It talks about manner and how you do a thing. See, is thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. In other words, how you do things will determine where you will go. How you do things will determine where you will go. Your attitude. So you have to clean yourself up. Again, we looked at, in looking at the courage and the strategy, that was preparation for the courageous move. Esther, she went into three days, she decreed a fast, a corporate fast of three days of prayer and fasting so that she can get the flesh, the nasty flesh under control and, and cut off the ties of the flesh and its appetites and its feelings so that her spirit, which is born after God, see all these virtues that I'm talking to you about, they're in your spirit. They're in your spirit, the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faithfulness, temperance, or self-control. All of that is the fruit of the born-again spirit. However, the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, envy, strife, jealousy, emulations, variance, all of that, that's the flesh. Esther realized we can't fight this in the flesh. We can't, because this is representing the kingdom of God, and there's too much on the line for us to try to fight this in the flesh. Because the devil is coming against, not just with the man, Haman, it's not flesh against flesh, but it was a spirit. And if you try to fight the devil in your flesh, and he's a spirit, he's a spirit, he's an evil spirit, and you're trying to fight a spirit battle in the flesh, well, flesh is perishable, and you will lose. You will lose. 
because flesh, the flesh, they that sow to the flesh shall reap corruption. But they that sow to the spirit shall reap life everlasting, Amen. eternal life. God, the God quality of life. And so you can't sow to your you can't sow to your flesh. You have to sow to your spirit to reap the kingdom of God because it was about the kingdom. Again, Esther was, she was in a position and she had a purpose to serve God's kingdom. It wasn't about, it wasn't just, you know, Mordecai because I don't, I just don't like Haman. I don't like how he looking at me. Walking on that horse, looking down at me like that. I don't like where he looking at me. No, it wasn't a flesh thing. Mordecai, he was in a position himself as Esther's uncle, but he was he had a destiny. We're looking at chosen. We're looking at the story of Esther. Esther, she's the title on the story, but Mordecai. See, a lot of times you don't realize as you play a part in someone else's story, it's also helping you to obtain your purpose for which you have been chosen. And it's for you to serve a position. Everybody has a position. And it's a destiny. If you will fulfill your purpose, your part, and when the waters rise, all the boats in the harbor goes up to their position, to a higher position. And we'll look later as this strategy, this courage and this strategy took place, we'll see how it turns out where not only does Esther fulfill her purpose for which she obtained, number one, favor, and she was placed in a position to carry out a purpose, to serve God's kingdom, to overcome the problem, answer the call through this, number seven, courage and strategy. But when she carried it out, at the end of it, not only does she remain in her position and become strengthened and secure in her position, but also Mordecai, who had raised her, he also is placed in his position as well. And not only Mordecai, but all the children of Israel, they were raised. Because there's this courage and this strategy, it has a great, great purpose. And so, going back to verse two, of Esther 5 quickly it says and it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand so Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter look at Esther chapter 5 verse 3 Verse 3, it says, Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Now, this is a part of number seven, the courage and the strategy. She had to have courage in order to come before the king unsummoned, because it had been 30 days and she had not been called. Because initially she told Mordecai when he called her to answer the problem that I have not been called these 30 days. It took courage for her to stand before King Ahasuerus. And we saw that there was preparation for the courageous move through prayer and fasting so that she can get the flesh down that she and her whole kingdom could be operating according to the spirit. Because again, this was the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the enemy. And this strategy where she invited the king, she invited the king and Haman 
to a dinner that was prepared. There is an enemy at the table. However, we know from Psalm 23 that God, he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Look at Psalm 23, verse 5, holding your place there in Esther 5. You have been chosen to represent God's kingdom for such a time as this. Psalm 23, verse 5. Psalm 23, verse 5. There was an enemy at the table because Esther, she invited King Ahasuerus and Haman to this feast. This is a part of the strategy, the courage and the strategy for overcoming the enemy. Not only was Haman an enemy to Mordecai personally, uh, Esther personally, but Haman was a representative of Satan as an enemy to God's kingdom, the people of God. And so Esther was placed in a position and she was called to confront the enemy in order to overcome Satan, who was the enemy to God's kingdom, and place the children of Israel back in a position as being the head and not the tail. Psalm 23, verse 5, it says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. So God, he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. So thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. This was a part of this strategy. He had a table prepared and the enemy was at the table. The enemy was at the table. Hallelujah. Look at holding your place there in Esther, holding your place there in Esther 5, and turn over, holding your place there in Esther 5, turn over to Matthew chapter 26, just to reemphasize that God's strategy can cause you to address your enemy that's up close to you. The enemy can be right up close to you. He'll use an enemy. He can use an enemy in your life, an enemy, a representative enemy in your life to cause you to overcome a larger enemy, which is Satan. Satan, Satan he's the ultimate enemy, the kingdom of darkness. But God can use a representative enemy that gets right up close to you that will cause you to win the larger battle. See, you've been chosen to win the larger battle. Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 20, it says, Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. So they were at the table. This is Jesus having the Passover. And they were at the table. And he says in verse 21, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto them, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. In other words, the Son of Man, he's going to fulfill his purpose as it is written of him. He, the Son of Man, he was chosen. He has favor with the Father, and he has the position of being the Son of God, the Messiah, and he has a purpose. He said, the Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, uh, according to his purpose. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, 
thou hast said. Thou hast said. So Judas, he was an enemy at the table. His purpose, he had walked with Jesus, but his purpose, he was fulfilling his purpose. His purpose, he was used as an enemy to betray Jesus into the hand of those that would crucify Jesus so that Jesus could fulfill his greater purpose, which was destroying the works of the devil that had us in bondage to sin and the, the curse of sin and separated from God. Jesus fulfilled his greater purpose, but Judas, an enemy at the table, was used to uh, cause Jesus to fulfill his greater purpose. Psalm 23 verse 5 said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now going back to Esther 5, quickly going back to Esther 5, going back to Esther 5, Esther 5 verse 4, and Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. So she is carrying out certain steps. Again, it's a strategy. She had the courage to stand before the king, she, but she prepared herself for the courageous move with fasting and prayer. So she's not moving according to her own thinking, her own natural thinking of how she should fulfill overcoming this enemy at the table. The enemy is at the table. Why? Because the enemy was the right-hand man of King Ahasuerus. So the enemy was already, he was chosen. He was in a position. And sometimes your enemy may be someone or some situation that you can't get away from. It's in a position in your life. It's in a chosen position or in a position in your life, and you can't get over it or get around it. You have to confront it, and you have to be courageous. You have to face it, but you also need a strategy in order to overcome it because that enemy is in place so that there can be a greater victory. God is using the, the enemy that's in place or in a position for you to confront courageously and strategically for a greater victory. Verse 9, Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. And so a lot of times your enemy, they're rejoicing. They think that they're winning. But if you know your God, see the Bible says, they that know their God shall do exploits. They that know their God shall do exploits. If you truly know your God, you know your God is not going to allow an enemy to overcome you. If you truly know your God, you know that you are the head and not the tail. If you truly know your God, you know that you are above only, exclusively, and not beneath. If you truly know your God, you know that you are the lender and not the borrower. If you truly know your God, you know that if an enemy comes out against you one way, they will flee before you seven ways. If you truly know your God, therefore you can be courageous. You don't have to be fearful when facing an enemy. But you should do like Esther and prepare for the courageous move and get the strategy from the Holy Spirit. Esther, she was allowing time, listening to the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit to move in order to take down her enemy because there was a greater victory 
that God was working on, and it wasn't just Haman. Haman was in a position representing the enemy, but God was looking at the enemy behind the enemy. See, a lot of times you're looking at the natural enemy, the person in front of you, or that situation on the job, or that situation in your family, or that situation in society. You're looking at the, the enemy in front of you, but there's an enemy behind the enemy. God is looking at the enemy behind the enemy, and God has a strategy to pull down the enemy behind the enemy. Judas, he represented an enemy betraying Jesus, but there was an enemy behind the enemy. It was sin. God used Judas, and he introduced Jesus to the cross by betraying him. Jesus went to the cross. It looked like he was dying and looked like he was defeated. He looked like he was defeated. He died on the cross. Day number one, he was in the grave. Satan was rejoicing. Demons were rejoicing. Day number two, they were rejoicing. They seemed like they were happy. Day number three, they were happy. But then early, early that morning, there was a rumbling. And the stone rolled away. And Jesus, he rose again from the dead. Because, and in him rising again from the dead, there was a great victory where while he was down there, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from Satan. Because Satan was the enemy behind the enemy. He was the enemy behind the enemy. And Jesus delivered us from sin, sickness, disease, poverty, lack, depression, oppression, and made us victorious in Christ Jesus because there was a greater purpose. And so looking here in verse 9 of Esther chapter 5, it says, Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. And when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. So Haman, he was rejoicing. Haman said, Moreover, yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. And so even when things are seemingly going well with your enemy, the enemy hates to see you standing in your righteousness. That's what Mordecai was doing. Mordecai was standing in his righteousness. He said, I am a son of God. I won't bow down to the devil. I am a son of God. He, he said, I won't bow down to the devil. And so because Mordecai refused to bow down to the devil, his enemy, even though he was rejoicing, even though he was in the position, even though he was chosen in the kingdom, he could not be totally at ease. Because one man was willing to stand up. And God wants you to stand up against the adversary. Verse 14. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. We're going we're gonna to stop right there. And we're gonna, next time, we're going to look at how that turned out. We're going to look at how that turned out for the enemy of God, for the enemy of God's kingdom. See, God, he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. We know how it turned out for Judas. He was at the table, and he, he was betraying Jesus, and he was eating at the table. 
but it didn't turn out well for Judas. And Judas, he was used by an enemy that was an enemy to Jesus by Satan. Anyone that lets the enemy use them, anyone that lets Satan as the enemy use them as the enemy to God's people, it won't turn out well for them. We're looking at chosen. We're looking at chosen. We're looking at the story of Esther. Today we've been looking at number seven, the courage and the strategy. And we're looking at this strategy that God gave to Esther in order to overcome the enemy, Haman. Because number one, Esther, she had obtained favor. Number two, she had obtained a position of being made queen in King Ahasuerus' kingdom. Number three, it was she had obtained a purpose, which was to serve, number four, the kingdom of Ahasuerus. But not only that, but number five, there was a problem to arise in the kingdom that confronted the kingdom of God. And she received, number six, the call to serve a higher purpose. And number seven, she prepared herself and she received the courage and a strategy to overcome the enemy to God's kingdom. And God wants you to know that whatever you're facing, whatever you're facing, God has a strategy. He wants you to prepare yourself and be courageous so that you can overcome whatever enemy that the enemy rises up against you because it's not always what you see that is the real enemy. There's an enemy behind the enemy, but also there's a greater victory behind overcoming that enemy. Father, we thank you for your word that has come forth today. We declare that so shall your word be that has gone forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish that which you please and prosper in us to whom you've sent it. You sent your word to us to heal us and to deliver us from all of our destructions. I declare that each one of us are good ground and your word shall bring forth a bountiful harvest in our lives, exceedingly abundantly above all that we could possibly ask a thing, according to the power of faith that works within us. As we leave this place, Father God, I thank you that the angels of the Lord are encamped around about each one of us, keeping us, guarding us, preserving us in all of our ways. I declare a hedge of protection, around us and around our families, around our finances, our health, around all that we have on every side. I declare that you've blessed the work of our hands, our businesses, our jobs, every means of income and finance. I declare that our wealth and our property is increased in the land. And I thank you, Father God, for blessing the work of our hands right here at Faith Country Holiness Church of Gallatin in this community. I pray your blessing upon the city of Gallatin, Nashville, surrounding areas, I pray your blessing and rest upon our nation. Guide, Father God, our leaders in Jesus' name. And I pray for godly order in our society. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, we thank God for everyone that has come out today. Thank God for his word that has gone forth. And we declare that so shall his word be that has gone forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto him void, but it shall accomplish that which he pleases and prosper in us to whom he sent it. And so as we uh, prepare to leave, I want to give an opportunity. If there's anyone you're needing prayer for any specific area, I want to give that opportunity. If there's anyone needing prayer, um, if I ask, as the scripture says, is there any sick among you? among us if there's any sick among us the bible says let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray for them anointing them with oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick or deliver the sick from that spirit of infirmity and the lord shall raise them up uh, break bring them back into full health and strength and if there's any sin, it shall be forgiven. So I want to give that opportunity if there's any sick or symptoms in your body that you would like a prayer of agreement right now and to be anointed with oil, I want to give you that opportunity for I can, so I, I as the pastor can pray over you and we'll see the power of God bring about healing in your body. And if there's anyone that has any other particular need, as I look over the congregation today, I can see that we here today, we're born again, we know Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if there's anyone, I want to give you that opportunity. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
And if there's no one at this time that you, you have no specific issues, that is good. That means the word is working mightily in you and your faith is working. And the just shall live by faith. And so we have not dominion over your faith, but we're helpers of your joy. And so as we leave this place, I want to encourage you to greet everyone. Let them know how much you love them, how glad you are to see them. And everyone have a blessed and prosperous rest of the week. And we'll see you next week right here at Faith Country Holiness Church of Gallatin at 10 o'clock. God bless you and you are dismissed.